Today we're going to begin a study of columns. In particular, we're going to be introducing a, a new idea called buckling, um, which is a form of instability, particularly in columns, meaning that um, if you think of a column, or even if you've ever like stepped onto a empty soda can, an aluminum can, you'll notice that it's it it's strong and then all of a sudden it will catastrophically collapse. That's called buckling. And this idea that you can go from a stable configuration to an unstable configuration in a catastrophic way is something that we definitely want to avoid when we engineer structures. So what we want to understand is what are the conditions, for example, if you have a column what are the loading conditions that will generate a buckled, a buckle, a buckling event? We want to avoid that. So today, um, we're going to begin moving towards buckling of columns by studying, rather than a differential equation, we're going to study a very simple idealized model of a column, just to kind of ground our understanding of buckling and stability, and then next time we'll introduce the actual differential equation for column buckling. That will be what you'll end up using if you ever use these equations in practice. So today we want to focus on buckling buckling of columns. And when I say column I'm thinking of a member, a structural member. We're going to focus on you know, pin supports on the bottom, then you're going to have some roller support at the top, and then there's going to be some a load P. The application of this load is going to cause the column to def deflect into a deflected shape. So this is very much like beam deflection. In fact, there's a very close relationship which we will eventually discuss. And so we end up through the application of the load P generating this deflection here, which we're also going to call little v eventually. Okay, before we do the full model here, let's look at an idealized model of a beam, of a, a column. Idealized. Okay, so let's, let's consider a column that's going to have the same same restraints on it but let's assume now that we have a joint here that's attached to a spring okay so there's a spring there and we're going to assume that these are infinitely rigid so the only place that we can have rotation is about the joint here and this let's give this as a point a b and c and this is going to be L over 2, L over 2. Okay, so we have this idealized column where in a, in a real column, every single material point at every position, can there can be a rotation theta. But here we're going to assume that between the supports and the joint B, that these are infinitely rigid um, structural member, so rotation only happens there. So when you apply this load, this this thing is going to deflect into a shape that looks like this. As you would expect. We have this uh, spring here, and now we can measure theta there. Okay, and so we've applied this force and we have kind of this idealized model of a column deforming. If you look at a free body diagram of this object, let's go ahead and do that down here. If we look at a free body diagram, we're going to have this thing here. We have a moment about B. You're going to have 
got some force responding to the applied force up here. And then this is going to be theta. Okay, so looking at that free body diagram from statics, we know that the moment at B, because it's a spring, the moment at B has to be twice the rotation, because you have rotation at the top and the bottom, times the spring stiffness. Call this B R. So that's what the magnitude of the moment at B. And so now if we sum the moments at B and set them equal to zero, we end up with M of B minus P theta L over two is equal to zero. And then if we plug in this expression here, we get that two beta R theta minus P L theta over two is equal to zero. And notice thetas can cancel now, which is an interesting thing. It means that in some sense this, this deformed configuration is in equilibrium regardless of the magnitude of theta. So theta really can be any value. Okay, so um, so if theta is equal to zero, this will work, but really it also works for any other value of theta. We can write that then as um, 2 beta r minus pl over 2 is equal to 0. Or if we rearrange for p, we can call, say that p is equal to 4 beta r over l. Okay, we're going to call this loading this loading, this equilibrium loading, we're going to call it the critical load. And what this critical load says is if, if the critical load, if you are at the critical load, you're going to be in a stable configuration independent of how large theta is. Right, so you're going to be in equilibrium and theta could be huge. So you could have large deflection. Uh, well, we're still going to assume that the deflections are small, but any range of theta that you'd like as long as this equilibrium condition holds, you'll be stable. Okay, so now the, here, we, here we now we can start talking about stability a little bit. Let me repeat this equation. We have P critical is equal to 4 beta R over L. Okay, so now what happens if P, if the applied load is less than P critical, we say that the structure is in a stable configuration. Okay, if P is less than this critical load, then we're going to be in a stable configuration. If P critical, if P is greater than P critical, then we're going to say that we're in an unstable configuration. Okay, and so it's kind of like saying any load up to P critical is um, going to generate a deflection where we, we know that the, the column will not catastrophically buckle. Whereas if you begin to push beyond P critical, you're going to be kind of in this unstable equilibrium state where at any point it might buckle. A way to think about this is, is if you've ever, let's say you have a bowl, okay, and you put it, um, let's say, so here's a bowl and you put a ball inside of it, or you turn the bowl over and you put a ball on top. This here is what we would call a stable situation, right? Because this ball can roll around, but we know it's always going to return 
it's always going to return to this equilibrium state with the ball at the bottom of the bowl. Whereas here, if you have any movement or any load to push the ball off of the... So it's, it's in equilibrium at the, the top point of the ball, but any change in the loading on the ball, it's going to fall off. Okay, so we could say this is unstable. This is exactly what we're talking about up here. So if, if in a stable situation, it's like we're, we're inside this bowl and our load P is less than P critical. So if, if we apply a load here, P, it's not big enough to move it so far away that we, we lose equilibrium. So it'll always roll back to the center of the bowl. That's the same thing with the column. Whereas here, if P is greater than P critical, it means we're going to roll right off in an unstable way. Okay, so we'll do a simple problem. Let's say we have we want to we want to compute the critical load of this particular configuration where we have a pin, but the spring now is down here, okay? So this is our beta r, and then we have a load up here, p. And this whole thing is length L, we'll call this point A and point B. We want to determine P critical. So again, we do statics. So let's draw an equilibrium um, in a free body diagram. Okay, we've got some moment at A equal to B r theta. We've got this up here, p, and then this distance here, using small angle approximation, is theta l. And so if we sum the moments about a, set them equal to zero, we end up with minus beta r theta plus p theta l is equal to zero, which implies that our critical load, p critical, is beta r over l. So you can see that there's really two ways to increase the stability of a column. One is to make the column shorter right? So if L gets smaller, the other way is to make the column stiffer, which would correspond to making B beta bigger. And so short squat columns, of course, are more stable than long slender columns. You can see it in this relationship right here.